thanks for the opportunity to give this brief talk. <coughs> I will try to keep very brief. Um, so I'm presenting a corpus-based toy model, a really, really toy model for DiscoCat, which is categorical composition and distributional semantics, just like functional composition goes the other way around. Um, so the main idea is that I wanted to have a one short picture of how you go from an annotated corpus with like context-free grammars, really. So perhaps I should say I'm not scared and I don't feel restricted to pre-group grammars at all. I like context-free grammars and uh, constituent structure trees. And I wanted a single picture of how you go from that to uh, semantics in some uh, linear category, knowing exactly which vectors you get and which structures you get, and having such a picture which gives you compositionality on the nose without having to put in additional structure. So perhaps I should say that compared to the previous talks on uh, Disco Cat, this is a very blunt notion of semantics. <coughs> There's not many subtleties here. It's a world made of objects which interact and have some modifiers, and that's pretty much it. There's no space for sentences even, because ultimately I believe that sentences say something about objects more than the other way around. So these are caveats, and I might want to add that I take the idea that semantics is counting really, really, really seriously to the point that I use natural numbers instead of real numbers, and, well, we'll see that things work out nicely. Anyway. So the plan here is we take some abstract corpus, which we model as some set of sentences, and we assume that each sentence is annotated with a constituent structure tree that gives you the grammar, really. So there's no ambiguity at the level of words and sentences because they're tagged. And what we want to do with it is we want to first obtain a pre-group grammar from a very simplified version of that sigma map. And then we want to obtain semantics in a category of semi-modules over some semi-ring. And there's good reason why I want to pick semi-rings and not the reals or the complex numbers as one usually does. And it's because it gives you more generality and you don't really lose anything. So in a certain sense, which I might explain later, these semantics are really free or minimal. So this is a picture of a constituent structure tree with an example of a sentence that I might want to build, uh, end up building a vector for in the end. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple sentence. It's a quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog of a passing lady. So there's three objects intuitively. There's a lady and fox and a dog, and they have some modifiers attached to them, and there's some interaction between them. And that's, that's really it. So I'll take a single common type for objects, and I will have nouns, which will be the object words of that type, and I will have modifiers or modifying words, which will be morphisms from that type to that type, like adjectives or determiners, and I will have some interaction fragments that connect them. And that's really the, all the ingredients. There's no sentence based. So an example of how you would kind of figure out which ones are determiners and which ones are your uh, basic objects. Oh, that says interaction words, that's actually objects, uh, object words. So you have fox, and then you can just look at the hierarchy of noun phrases, and you can say, oh, I want those to define my objects in some uh, partial order of from least specific to more specific. And I can order them, and then you can define the interaction fragments to be the ones that you need to collate these together. And this is a very, very minimal notion of syntax. It's a very minimal grammar, and it's a very blunt one, but still it, it captures uh, quite a lot, considering how simple it is. Uh, you get that sort of tree that describes your hierarchy and how things are related, and you want to use this to translate them into some vectors in some linear space. So first I have to pick a category, and I will pick a category of semi-modules over some semi-ring, and I will not necessarily, as I said, take the reals, so I'll take a involved commutative summary to be precise, and I'll take the category where objects are the free vector spaces, if you wish, uh, what well, <coughs> are semi-modules really, generated by finite sets, and the morphisms are just matrices valid in this semi And the reason one might want to do this is because a lot of examples that we have seen uh, in the years are in this form, for example, REL is the example of the booleans, the real and complex vector spaces are in this form, the convex cones, which are an example of convex structures, are in this 
form, so just positive reals, not all the reals. And what I'm interested in is like multisets, really, and multifunctions, if you wish, or multi-relations. So sets with counting multiplicity. It's the idea that you want to count occurrences of things. And yes? If R is N, what's the end relation? Uh, it's the identity, because you just want to sum them. The idea is that N is already, has a notion of positivity and all of N is positive. So there, I might mention quickly that for the purposes of doing this sort of semantics, one needs uh, Dagger compact categories, really. And, well, all the categories of our same modules are Dagger symmetric, conoidal, and they are compact closed, they have self dual objects, and they have classical structures, which are written in the usual way. It's the multiplication uh, unit and co-multiplication co unit. And feel free to read them top to bottom or bottom to top. It doesn't really matter right now. But the picture at the end will be bottom to top. So sorry, uh, I guess I just, I work with Bob too much. <laughs> <laughs> and this one doesn't matter how you read these? Well, no, because you can take the joint, dual. really, and oh, okay, okay. It, it still works the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, joint, the co multiplication will be the other way around, and they're dual. So perhaps very, very quickly, why one, one, to why might one to choose the natural numbers, well, ultimately? You can just change same ring by changing coordinates of your vectors, and it turns out that n is initial in your category of same ring. So there's always a unique map, and that is really the minimal thing you need to be able to count things. So if you take semantics as counting seriously, well, that's your starting point. And there's always a canonical way of turning any other model, any other model, model into, um, sorry, this model into any other model, because you can just count in n and then map to your desired same. So I'll go quickly. Uh, you take a basis of the word instances in the sentences of your corpus. So this is a very free model. You just take all the possible instances, and then you want to take indicator functions. That's, that's the main idea. So you take the space spanned by these instances, and you interpret a word as its indicator function. You just put one wherever you find it in the corpus, and zero everywhere else. And then you model modifiers as the projectors over all the word instances that are modified by that specific word. So if I have something like quick in this, in my original example, I know that that particular instance of fox will be in the subspace of the modifier. And similarly, if I have the, I know that both fox and dog will be in the subspace of that modifier, and so on and so forth. And this gives us some logic uh, from the operator algebra. And I should mention that this looks quantum, but since you're doing it over the naturals, it's not really quantum because all your operators are commuting. So it is not quantum in that sense, but it is quantum in the sense that you have uh, conjunction as intersection and you have uh, negation as the complement, the ortho complement. So it is quantum in that sense, operation, let's say. And then you have interactions, and interactions are similar. Basically, they project over the subspace of uh, the two words that they, mod they make uh, interact if you wish, but then obviously you have to combine them somehow, and that plus map is just something that came out of perhaps an observation of Bob, which is that we, we tend to write these vectors as tensor products and they take a very large space, but ultimately we will mostly just use the uh, additive structure of them. So there is an implicit conversion at some point from this tensor structure to an additive structure, there is the compression. That plus map is exactly the compression map. It takes the two vectors and sends them to the sum, at least on the basis, I should say. But that's really what you want in this specific case. And what the interactions do is they just act as uh, a projector on the subspace where the two objects are interacting. So it makes them behave as the joint object in a certain sense. And once we have all of this, we just combine <coughs> it and use some spider theorem. And that is our sentence interpreted as a vector in any category of r same modules. And I guess that is the punchline of the talk. But there, are, there is some future work because there's a lot of things to do. First of all, well, pronouns and conjunctions are done. Oh, yeah, I'll just go quickly over it. Pronouns have not been treated properly and conjunctions have not been treated properly because, as Dimitri showed before, it's actually a pretty hard thing to do and you have to do some interesting stuff, which I didn't and not good enough, I think. But I will consider just trying to adapt 
some of that work and apply it here. That's really nice. Uh, you can do a lot with choosing the right semitone. You can add polarity, you can add modality by just adding new elements, new item potents to your semitone. And you can definitely, I should try and figure out a way to compress this very large abstract free model down onto a concrete model with something like johnston linear strauss transform methods or similar. And I guess I should mention that there's also the possibility since it's Coppa Plus to do CPM construction and do entailment and do ambiguity. And perhaps uh, in a different direction, one might want to consider enriched theories. These, these theories are all enriched over themselves because they are, are linear. Mm. And one can code more than just graph structure, one can code simplicial structure and get more semantics out of that. And that I've already started working on and I think it's a pretty message. So that's that. Thank you very much. You said it, but you went a little fast. The, the, the dimension of the space that you're modeling in is the sum of the lengths of all the sentences. It is the sum of the length of all the sentences, yes. So it's, a, it's a even larger than usual space, I guess. Uh, what are quantifiers? Uh, so quantifiers modify. So when you say it's like a fox or all foxes, they become a modifier. So well, it gives you a projector over sentences where you have an all foxes. It's it's really really blunt. When I said blunt, I meant blunt. So you don't <laughs> No, you they are treated exactly as uh, other oh. modifiers. So, so they become projectors. The same. Oh, yeah. Okay. So basically, the idea is that this is a it's a free model. So you would get the distinction by making an appropriate projection and compressing it down. And when you compress, the distinction between things that have certain modifiers <laughs> and things that are harder modifiers will arise. But it arises from higher structure that you don't see at this level. And the idea is, it, I would want to see how much of that actually arises by just compressing. And I think quite a lot could, because there's some specific relation between when you use all and when you don't. And there should be a relation just in a very large corpus between the sentences where you have like all foxes and all the other sentences where you have foxes. And that relation should influence how your projection works but I've not done that, and I can't say that it will work or it won't work or what it will need to work. So when it's done, I'll be happy to let you know. Question from Dominic? Yes. yes. Uh, um, on uh, just a sort of standard word of warning on that point, that um, not being sure whether all is appropriate or not is one of the sort of standard ways to get into rhetorical arguments that, uh, you know, um, um, some Americans shoot people, but don't say it's true. Americans shoot people. Uh, that's a bit of a brutal thing to say, not really true. All Americans shoot people, definitely not true. Um, and the way people, <coughs> uh, particularly politicians, uh, very deliberately manipulate phrases like that is a large source of error. In fact, one of the, the, th the way I suggest going about this is you could do it as a project to uh, deliberately try and detect those rather shallow, deliberate manipulations. I see. Yeah, yeah no, uh, that is a, that's, that's an excellent point. I might say you have uh, so modifiers, or better, interaction in this case, the shooting to people, <coughs> which you can just phrase as it becomes a projector because you just put shooting and people, and then you have a map which is has one input and one output, and mm -hmm. it is actually a projector. You can do something like that as shoots or not shoots uh, people, and that will give you sort of an observable, and you can evaluate that against American. Mm -hmm. American will be at the root of every object which specifies American, and you can use that to estimate whether that's true or not independently of all or some. Right. So if you are ev evaluate it just on American, that is something. But then the use of some and all is more sophisticated, of course. So what about yeah. other quantifiers, like two, exactly two, at least two, those are even more? That's a, that's a good question from a free point of view. I would say that if, if you say, if you have a sentence that has two, exactly two, or at least two for a specific object, but then the rest of your corpus doesn't reflect any difference in the relation between those objects, yeah. then, I mean, that sentence doesn't have a lot of meaning with respect to the knowledge that the corpus provides. So you're restricting yourself to the knowledge that the corpus gives you, not anything else that you might put on it. So if you say something which to a human being would sound very specific, but then it's not reflected in any other like topological or um, 
metric constraint from the corpus, then that's... Well, you could go and browse your corpus and verify if, if, this, if this yeah. is the case are exactly two dogs had two the bones. Yeah, it's you can, true. yeah, exactly. That, that is a question you can phrase, but yeah, that's an external that. question. That's a sort of a meta question from the, the free point of view. The way to like information about sentinel work in the corpus should reflect the information in the corpus. Yes. And your model doesn't seem to do No, it can't, because it's, it's free. <coughs> that would arise from the compression that you do afterwards. So when you compress it, you get things like that, but from the free perspective, that just tells you what appears in the corpus and how it's related, but it doesn't tell you an interpretation of specific words that you might have. It just tells you how they are related pairwise in a certain sense, or with a hypergraph, perhaps. So the compression would actually have both? Yeah, I would say that most of the, a lot... Only compression is sort of noise, but now it adds no lights, adds content. I would claim that, and again, I'm not going to stake anything <coughs> on it since I'm on camera, but um, I would claim that a lot of semantics arises from the way you compress things down. Like a lot of it. Most of it, perhaps. Um, or if you wish, the interplay between the meta semantics, a question you can ask about your database, and the internal semantics, so questions that are embodied by sentences in your corpus, that arises from compression. So, th well, that's a pretty important identification that you want to make when you do uh, sense analysis, I guess. Okay, I guess we'll move to the break. Okay. Um,